So what you're going, actually going to get is the reduced Shakespeare version of the European General Data Protection Regulation. And I'm focusing on one of the plays, and that is consent, because I think consent is, is of concern to all of us in terms of what the changes may be. So where are we? We're a bit lost. This has been going on since 2012, uh, officially, but certainly a lot before that. And we don't really know where we are yet. What we do know is that there are three versions of the truth. Um, we have to take the opinion from the Commission, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the Council of the European Union. So all of those three have put in their, their versions of this regulation, and now they're in the, the process of hammering out who, who wins on what point. But they've said that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So whatever you hear today is up for kind of vision of what might happen in the marketing community. Um, we may be wrong on some things, we may be right on some things. I hope we're more right than wrong, and so far I'm pretty confident, confident of that. So these, these three players, the trilogue is underway. It started in June uh, this year. Uh, when do we get the final text, which will be the first time all three areas have come together? Um, I would say first quarter next year. They've run late on everything so far, so I don't expect them to make their December deadline. And then implementation through our government, through, through the governments of the 28, um, they have two years to do that, and we have two years to plan what we're going to do. And believe me, you're going to need every day of that two years. Um, although I'm going to talk about consent today, I'm just going to give you a flash highlight on some other areas, and I'll cover these in the roundtables this afternoon in more detail. It's a regulation, not a directive, so no changes. Once that text comes out, nobody has a, a chance to change it. We are seeing a little, a few areas where agreement may not be reached, so we're calling that the directivization of the regulation because they may, on a country-by-country -country basis, agree that there are some differences in, in cultural interpretation. Uh, proof of consent uh, is going to be quite an important one for you guys, I think, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Uh, legitimate interest. This sort of covers B2B, but we don't know what terms that might be. Um, you all have legitimate interests where you can override the needs of the individual with your own interests if you can justify it. Um, they'll want you to publicize that. They'll want, want um, proof of consent so that the, the, the sort of collection of what you said on what date in your data collection statements and privacy policies is going to become very, very much more important. Um, legitimate interests may cover mail. So even though we're looking at opt-in, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a minute, mail may eventually stay as opt-out. Whether that's first and third party, I don't know. I would think mail at first party, definitely. Third party, we'll have to wait and see. Um, profiling, that's too long a discussion to have now. It's hugely, uh, uh, it will hu hugely impact on your businesses. Um, data protection officers, parts of the text um, say there should be one. Uh, other, other parts of the text say um, it'll be up to the, U the countries. But if you're looking for a new career, start training now because there'll be too few of them across Europe. Data breaches, um, the, the, the text says, one of the text says, 72 hours um, to notify a breach. That's not going to be long enough, prom I promise you. If every view, any of you have had, um, unfortunately had one, you'll know it takes you a lot longer than that to get to the bottom of it. Data processes, your suppliers' responsibilities. If you're a supplier, you better start looking at what your systems um, and your security, et cetera, um, whether it's up to scratch or not. You've all heard about these fines and sanctions. I think they'll end up being stepped to that maximum. And the right of erasure, um, formerly the right to be forgotten, is still in the text. So who needs to worry? If you're a data controller, worry. If you're a data processor, worry. Those who deal in data, worry. Regulators, worry. But I hope I'm going to show you a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, we feel that treacle, don't we? I mean, we've, we've gone through this in so much detail over, over so long that we, we're stuck at the minute. So, marketing consent. Uh, Parliament and Commission want explicit consent. 
the council has amended this to unambiguous. So immediately we have a difference that needs to be filled. And I looked up un unambiguous and a few definitions. It's, to me, that's almost towards explicit. But remember what I said about legitimate interest, B2B maybe, and post, probably first party, not necessarily third party. UK, good old government, they've been in there banging away on this. They want to go stay with the um, current definition, freely given and informed indication of wishes. We'd like to stick with that. We don't want explicit consent and we don't want unambiguous consent. Um, if we can stick with what we've got, it will be wonderful, but I think the UK government will lose this battle. We've been looking at OP4 at... Uh, Privacy notice wording, so a privacy notice is the data collection wording that you use at time of collection, which is the one that rules the relationship right through until somebody changes their mind. And don't collect data like this, and I promise you this is an actual data collection statement from a few years ago. It just throws everything in, in there. Can you imagine signing up to anything that looks like that? In our research, 76% um, said they disapproved of it, so... Looks like long copies the, the problem. No, short copies just as bad. They hated this one even more, 82%. Now, in September 2013, we had this game-changing uh, consumer uh, advice from the Information Commissioner. If you haven't read it, all 191 paragraphs of it, I do have a summary of it, <laughs> what it really means. Um, but it did con change consumer direct marketing in the electronic channels. Uh, just delivered you one paragraph out of here. Uh, the person must specifically consent to the type of communication in question. So no more of this. Um, we'd like to contact you, and we don't tell you how. Tick this one box, or tick this box if you don't want to hear it. Now we have to separate out the channels. And at the time that happened, we thought, God, this is going to be the death knell. This is going to be so terrible. So um, we looked at what... Um, might make a change to consent levels when we were started working on how we might find a way around this. Age and gender make a difference. The older the audience and um, the, the less they are likely to consent. What's being requested, don't, never ask for too much at one time. Go back in a staged, a staged way. What circumstances you collect it under, where you're doing it. What channel pref preferences are collected. Will data be shared with third parties? Who's asking? Is it a brand that's uh, recognisable and trusted? What's in it for them? The data value exchange. Now, I will give my data for communication purposes for marketing if I trust the brand, if it's something I want, if I'm interested in it. Um, but you, you saw from research earlier this morning um, that it's about that relationship um, and you want to be able to get, get the customer tuned into you. Wording and tone of voice, so important, as you saw from those two examples of early testing. So we launched a data permission benchmark with online research agency FastMap. Op4 wrote the statements, and on the online panel, it was run by FastMap and delivered to FastMap. Why online? Because you get an immediate response. Um, and also, if you're testing live data, um, ABC splits on... on um, uh, data protection wording, um, whatever you promise in that wording has to go all the way through that relationship. So you start causing yourself horrible problems downstream when you've got conflicting data protection statements. Uh, nationally representative, statistically viable, and statements are tested against 14 attributes. We develop these attributes. They, they largely fall into two areas, clear, trustworthy, honest, um, my data will be safe, gives me choice, etc. I'm in control. And then the others are, it's appealing, inviting, um, uh, and values me and welcomes me. So they largely fall into that, but sometimes what you want is all of them meshing together with some nice high scores. Um, we send out the email to this audience that's used to doing this, and um, their responses come back, are tabulated into charts like this. So we can take a look, a snapshot immediately, and say, the darker the red, the worse they hate it. <laughs> um, and the higher the green, the more they like it. So 
Um, and we'll do a two-stage. We, we normally do five statements at a time, um, although the case history I'm going to give you, we did 35 statements in one, in one test. Um, and uh, out it goes, back it comes, analysed, and then uh, we make a decision on whether to retest some of the best statements or not. And I'm going to give you a football club. Wish I, I wish I could give you a football club. <laughs> Okay, what did we test? Wording and tone of voice. You know, those interested in football um, speak a different language to some of the rest of us, and I'm a fan now, so I, I'm speaking that language too. We wanted to know whether they were highly interested or somewhat interested in football, what their gender and age was, what the first party um, and third party like, likes and dislikes were, whether we put them together in one statement or whether we separated them and whether uh, testing the difference between only having that one box um, and having all the channels unbundled. So multiple, multiple tests, I can tell you. We spend a lot of money testing things in direct marketing and not enough money testing data protection statements where your revenue can be increased because you've got more people to talk to. Okay, so here's the statement that we put the control statement in. It had been running for a while wasn't necessarily compliant after 2013, um, so we thought we'd have a nice control um, scenario. The first statement is um, an opt-out, prefer not to receive these messages, and the second statement for third parties is, is an opt-in, because they want to host messages by email on behalf of third parties. So, what did we get in the results? Some good, some good green, which I was very pleased with, although they don't believe that the data will be safe, and that's getting to be more and more important as time goes on. People know what uh, the risks are with losing their data, very more con uh, conscious about that. So we got 33% for the football club and its official sponsors and partners, and 26% consent to, for future marketing messages from third parties. But here are the dislikes. One box is opt-out, one another is opt-in. They don't like that. They're tr you're trying to fool me. You're trying to trick me into giving you consent, and I'll be sorry forevermore. Um, and this uh, data security issue. Um, the word not being underlined came up a few times, which was very interesting, because in the old days, we didn't used to say that. We used to let them plough through the wording. But um, we could see that using uh, just underlining one word makes an incredible difference to um, uh, the, the response that you get, the approval rating that you get. Then we went on to the next stage and we looked at unbundling the channels. So here you get the by mail, by post, by telephone, by SMS, for first party and for third party. Um, effectively, this t has turned itself into an opt-in because you're giving them that choice. If email is your chosen channel, on top of all the other clever things that you do, then this works for you. If post is your channel, then we would try a slightly different technique, because even putting these channels in a different order changes the ratios. So um, putting email first uplifts. Probably putting post first would uplift on, on, on this. So just a reminder here of um, what we did. We started out with 33% first party and 26% third party. Separating the channels, um, we took that 33% up to 63% on email, just in that one change in the statement. Uh, post was 19%, so that had come down. But as I say, if post is your channel of choice or a channel of choice, then there are techniques that we would use to do that slightly differently, to uplift the post whilst trying not to depress the email. As you can see, the um, phone and um, SMS, they hate marketing by SMS. Every, every study we've done, this com this, these numbers ring true. And then what won? Well, we got email up to 73%. We got post to 23%. So we've actually uplifted quite a lot within, within that um, first party. And we've taken a third party uh, from 26 to 42 percent. So using some of these techniques, testing properly, um, is the way to go. And I think that's something you should be thinking of doing now before this regulation comes in. 
I uh, just want to finish with preference management. This is what you're going to need to store, so you're, you're going to need many more fields on, on your database in which to store this information and manipulate it. The purpose or purposes for which the consent was um, for processing was been obtained. Was it to fill, fulfill an order, a customer request? Uh, and whether you could, uh, how you obtained consent for direct marketing? Because if you have been using an opt-in in any scenarios, then there's no need for repermissioning. B2B or B2C, legitimate interest, we'll get the definition that will guide us as to how we can use that to, be, to our best advantage. By all of these different channels, you know, not just the four that I've highlighted that um, we put into our research, but all sorts of areas. And we may need, sorry to say, some consent along the lines of what you're talking about under the profiling rules, yeah. What did you say in the privacy notice? What did you say when you collected the data? Um, proof of consent, how are you going to handle that? Um, have you done first and third party? Have you separated them? Are they together? What can you do to tidy up your database now in what I call this um, make hay period between now and when the law, the, law, the actual um, text comes through and then when the law is enacted? For your own and similar products and services, by brand, by product, by division, by company, by the whole group, and in a group situation, you're all third parties to one another. <laughs> by third parties for their marketing purposes, and third party to whom data has been supplied, so the, you know, the co-op and the list rental side of the business, you may have to advise the people who've rented that list if somebody wishes to come off it. And by the type of profiling for which consent has been gained or refused. So think about how that's going to affect and the cloud EEA processing. In fact, processing outside the EEA um, is not going to get you off the hook because the rules apply to anybody in the world, any country in the world. My advice, act now. Start thinking about it now. And that's me done.